Now, so this is chapter 23, where we're starting to do something that, that's actually more familiar to you. You've probably all heard of volts before, and it's actually a bigger deal than just the something that you've heard of. It's an actually an entirely different way of doing physics. And in fact, it's sort of the way that Maxwell wrote his equations was in terms of these uh, uh, potentials, okay? Electric potential is nice. Gravi I mean, magnetic potential gets kind of ugly because it's not technically really uh, a scalar potential that can be done except in very rare cases. So the uniqueness or the wonder of the voltage is that you can take and learn everything we've done using Coulomb's law for force and Coulomb's law for the electric field. We can now take that and do it in a scalar realm, okay? Uh, and then we're even able to take that scalar realm where you're not doing vectors and we can do some calculus on it to get the vectors back out of it. In other words, there's a way to convert back from scalar potentials to actual electric fields. So that's sort of the advantage of going to voltage. Uh, voltage is not unlike potential energy. So in fact, that's a good way of thinking about it. For instance, when people talk about circuits, if you if you go to, for instance, a uh, uh, electronic technician training program, uh, one of the things they'll often do is they'll treat a battery as if it's like a flight of steps going up. And then you get to the top of the battery and then you leave horizontally. And then you run into say a, a resistor or a light bulb and that's like some steps down. And then you come back and run back into the bottom of the battery. So they're literally seeing like the voltage as being heights. And that's exactly what potential energy is, is a height. Remember, potential energy was, in, or, well, was MGH and, and 241. So it's mass times gravitational acceleration times the height you are above some arbitrary zero level. So the only difference between volts and potential energy is just like we did with the electric field. Remember, we took the force and we were bothered by it reaching out over a distance without us seeing any tendrils or anything grabbing it it reached out across a distance and pulled on something uh, without anything connecting between them. So he said, well, maybe we can stop thinking about two charges at a time. We can think of one charge at a time and that charge alters the aura around itself. Okay, It creates an aura around itself. And we treated that as the electric field. And we basically took the force equation that we had from Coulomb, which was Q1, Q2 over four pi epsilon not R squared, we took that and divided out one of the cues. In other words, the cue that's feeling the force, we divide out the cue that's causing the, the disturbance or the aura is the source of the field. So really all we did to go from forces to electric fields is we divided out a charge. Well, in the same way, we can take the potential energy, which we use either, some books will use like V, some books will use U, our books using U for potential energy. And if you divide that potential energy by a charge, specifically the charge uh, that would be experiencing the potential, then you get something called the voltage. So that automatically tells you that the units of a volt must be a joule per coulomb. And it's, in fact, that's right, okay? So what we do is we imagine a scenario and I'm looking basically, oh, by the way, I want to show you on my cool shirt. Science, it's like magic, but real. Isn't that excellent? Total nerd. My One of my good friends gave that to me. Uh, so we think of work as like force times distance. If you look on, say, page uh, uh, 608. So you can think of work as force times distance. And in fact, what work really is, work is equal to the integral of F dot DL. And those of you who had me for 241, remember me painstakingly beating you up, telling you this is a line integral, blah, blah, blah. Well, we're still doing that, okay? <laughs> but what we now know is that the force, since we defined our electric field in some sense to be the limit as Q approach zero, of the force divided by Q, then we can see that the force is just Q times E. So we'd say integral of QE dot DL, and that would be the work. But we could also realize that the change in potential energy, which usually means U final minus U initial, remember, uh, anytime you have a delta, that refers to final minus initial. So we could also write it as UB minus UA 
if we were taking A as the initial position in the uh, in in space and B as the final position in space, that's going to be equal to the negative of the work done, right? If you if your potential energy increases, that's going to be a result of you uh, someone doing work on you. So in other words, if you want to increase your potential energy, you're going to have to get higher in the air. So someone could come along and lift you up with a force that's parallel to the upward direction. And that's the work done on you. So uh, this is actually the negative then of the work done by you. So we go, that's going to be equal to the negative of the work done by you. And that negative, of course, is uh, the same thing you get here, basically Q times E. And if we did some distance D, it'd be QED, right? So what we can do is say, well, let there exist a quantity delta V, which would be V final minus V initial, which would be VB minus VA. And that's going to be U or delta U over Q. That's what voltage is. So this V is voltage. It's also called electric potential. Okay. It's not called electric potential energy. Because the electric potential energy is still a potential energy. That's that's the U quantity. Okay. So this is potential energy, but the uh the volts per coulomb are the actual electric potential. So we'll say the units for voltage is equal to uh, a joule per coulomb. And that's defined to be one volt. Okay, so we now have a new unit. And in fact, what we can do is we can say that the uh, the actual change in voltage is the negative of the work done divided by the charge. So that's another way of looking at it. It's not necessarily the help, helpful way, but what I like to do is go ahead and write uh, the change in voltage in terms of an integral uh, that we can use. So if I say, uh, for instance, delta V is equal to VB minus VA, which is also V final minus V initial, I like to go ahead and tell everybody, okay, well, that is actually the negative integral of E dotted with DL, and I'm integrating supposedly from position A to position B. Okay? That's what this potential is. That's something that's going to come handy for us. Okay? So let's, for instance, take a typical scenario. Uh, let's look at moving a uh, charge from one side of a capacitor to another side of a capacitor. Let's say... Uh, is that integral something we can use then? Yes, this is something we're going to use repeatedly. This is probably one of the most fundamental equations that you'll use this semester. We're going to use it a lot, for instance, to find capacitance, things like that. Uh, this is actually, all these are really definitions. So the key thing to know about them is this is where this junk came from, okay? Uh, and then, of course, that unit thing. So if we want to talk about, for instance, two parallel plates, what we learned in Chapter 22 was that the electric field due to an infinitely large plate. Now, these clearly aren't infinitely large, but the deal is that if, we, uh, if we're really close to them or they're really close together, then the distance from the center, from where you are to the edge is very much larger than the distance between them. Then they act like an infinite plane. And when we do that, what we found was for an infinite plane, the electric field was equal to sigma over two epsilon naught in the positive direction on one side and negative sigma over two epsilon naught in the negative direction for the other side, right? So if you had this one, which is a positive plate, 
that would create an electric field. Let's call this number one. That would cause an electric field E1 pointing this way. If you had this one, which is a negative plate, that would create an electric field this way, call it E2. And this is between the plates. Therefore, the total electric field between the plates would be sigma over epsilon naught i hat where I'm seeing my x-axis is this way. Okay, so notice sigma over 2 epsilon naught plus sigma over 2 epsilon naught gives me sigma over epsilon naught. Out here, I would get E1 pointing this way and E2 pointing this way. So E equals 0 over here. Over here, I would get E1 pointing this way and E2 pointing that way. So out here, I get E equals zero. That's what a capacitor is. It's basically two plates. Now, I'm, I'm greatly exaggerating the distance between them uh, just so I could write everything I need to say. Normally, what you'd have is something like a plate that tall, but that close together. That's a very much more typical capacitor. And in fact, it sometimes can get so close that the air breaks down and it allows a lightning strike to cross it. And you've got then a failed capacitor. They actually make some that can handle it, but generally they, they're not made to handle that. So that's what a typical capacitor is. It becomes a part of a circuit where you connect, for instance, this to the positive side of the battery and this to the negative side of the battery, then this would have a positive charge and that would have a negative charge, exactly the opposite from what I showed up there. So that's really what we're talking about here is a capacitor. I'm looking sort of at your book's example, 23-2, which says an electron in a cathode ray tube, uh, suppose an electron in a cathode ray tube is accelerated from rest through a potential difference of VB minus VA is equal to 5,000 volts. What is the change in electric potential energy of the electron? And what is the speed of the electron as a result of this acceleration? So we're working sort of a problem like that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have uh, this connected to a battery. So this capacitor is gonna be connected to a battery. That's gonna be the positive side, okay? And then this will be the negative side. And we're gonna have a little electron that's gonna fly this way, okay? And we're gonna say this is point A, and we're gonna say this is point B. And what we're told is VB minus VA is actually positive 5,000 volts. And I'll pretend that's four sig figs, okay? What we wanna find is the change in potential energy, and that's electric potential energy, by the way. So I wanna try and find the change in uh, electric potential energy of the electron. And then I wanna find how fast it's going at the end, okay? So, we're matching the electron right here. Now the electron right here, this is the low voltage side, right? And we think of a low voltage is where the current heads to and the current leaves the high voltage. So you're used to thinking of things going this way. The electron behaves exactly the opposite. It actually goes from the low electric potential to the high electric potential. That's why it's plus five there. So what we're going to do for this is we're going to realize that the uh, actual delta U, the change in potential energy, is Q times delta V. That came from that definition. This is a, this is a very important equation that we'll use repeatedly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say delta U is equal to negative 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. That's the actual... Uh, charge of an electron times the change in V, which is 5,000 volts. 
And that gives me a potential energy of uh, 1.602 e to the negative 19 times 5,000. And this is 801 using engineering notation, 801 times 10 to the negative 18th joules. Okay. Remember, a volt is a joule per coulomb. So that's that's how when you multiply it by coulomb, it comes out to be joules. There's actually a much better unit for this, by the way, and it's called the electron volt, which you can look right here and see why you would call it the electron volt, because the one electron volt is gotten by taking the charge of an electron and multiplying it by one volt. So one electron volt is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th uh, joules. So if I wanted to convert this to electron volts, I divide it by 1.602 times the negative 19th. And in fact, I would get, uh, by the way, this is a negative. I should have wrote that negative there. I would get a negative uh, 5,000 electron volts. Okay. So any questions on that? I've now introduced a new unit of energy that we'll use quite often. It's really valuable when you're using electrons, protons, neutrons, that kind of thing. Uh, so there's two ways of talking about that. Uh, now we're going to do part B. So we've already found that the delta U, the change in potential energy, is uh, let's call it 8.01 times 10. Notice I divided that by 100, so i got to multiply this by 100. So that's 10 to the negative 16th joules which is also equal to negative 5,000 electron volts. Again, put a decimal there. So that's the change in potential energy. And remember, potential energy is final minus initial. Uh, the final uh, electric potential energy must have been a higher potential than the last one, right? And, and what that means is, is like you got higher above the ground. That's how your potential energy increased. We took an electron that was negative and we moved it over to here. So now we got a potential energy that's negative. Now what I wanna do is realize that this potential energy can actually be create, uh, turned into kinetic energy. And all we have to do is say, uh, Delta U is equal to one half MV squared, as long as we're not approaching you know, the speed of light. Well, so otherwise we then have to use like gamma uh, MC squared or something like that to actually calculate it. So if it comes up to well under the speed of light, then we'll know this equation was fine and we'll keep it. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna say, uh, V is equal to two delta U over M. And I'm gonna take the square root of all that. So in this case, the kinetic energy is gonna to have to equal the negative of it, of course. So because the change of potential energy, it's actually going to decrease in potential energy as the kinetic energy increases, that's why I put that negative there, and that's why it's negative is going to come in here. I'll get the square root of two times, in this case, positive 8.01 times 10 to the negative 16th joules. And then I'm going to divide that, of course, by the mass of the electron, which is 9.109 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms. And when I do that, I get two times 8.01 e to the negative 16 divided by 9.109 e to the negative 31st square root of all that junk gives me 41.93 I just got 41.9 times 10 to the sixth meters per second. Okay. So what we see is uh, the speed of light is 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. If I wanted to put this in 10 to the eighth, 
uh, for starters, I could divide this by 10. That would make that 4.1. But I have to multiply this by 10. That'd be 4.1 times 10 to the seventh. So it's a little bit bigger than 10% of the speed of light is what we see from this velocity. Multiplying this by 10 moves the decimal one place this way. Of course, then I got to, uh, if or should be dividing this by 10 moves the decimal one place this way, then multiplying that by 10 makes this 10 to the seventh. So I get 4.19 times 10 to the seventh, which again is a little bit less than 10% of the speed of light. Uh, I probably wouldn't hurt to use relativity there, but it's not going to be off by a god awful amount. So, any questions on that? Now, the biggest thing we're doing is yes, we can use this kind of stuff to figure out, you know kinematically and dynamically what's going to happen to electrons uh, but what i'm going to do it for mostly is to do things like let's actually compute what the voltage is across a capacitor so let's say for instance that we have a voltage of 50 volts and let's let's uh realizing that this electric field from what we did at the end of class last time oh by the way i, I forgot to tell you guys this uh, when class was over, I realized about two minutes afterwards that I cut your class short. I ended it at 12 instead of 12.20. So I was supposed to do a flat plane Gauss's law problem. So I did put it on the end of the video, but the end of the video, uh, the video hasn't been put up yet because I had to put up the other videos that had to be edited first. Uh, now my Tuesday video for 241 just went up. I'm hoping in between lab and lecture, the 242 video for this class for Tuesday will go up. So it should be up by lab, uh, by the beginning of lab. But anyways, on the end of that, it's another example of using Gauss's law. And I'll do that example a bunch of times. So it's not like you missed it, but it's already on the video so you can check it out. And what I derived was this actual result that the electric field is sigma over two epsilon naught uh, on say this side pointing, well, for this one, it's negative. So it point this way. And then on this side, it would be pointing this way. Uh, but the main thing is that's where that came from. And me this morning showing you, or this afternoon, or what well, is still morning, showing you that these two combine in between because they're absolutely charged, that gives me the sigma over epsilon naught itself. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to say, how is this voltage across a capacitor related to the electric field? And in fact, does it give us an electric field that seems consistent uh, with what we found from Gauss's law? So if you, for instance, want to take and calculate the voltage in going from uh, one plate of a parallel plate capacitor to another, let's say this side is connected to a positive 50.0 volt battery, and this side's connected to 0.0, .0 volts. Really, that's basically what circuits are is you sort of say the, the long bar here, this part of the battery, when you draw a battery, you either draw it like this, you can even do three of those, or you just draw it like this. The long part is supposed to be the high voltage part, and the short part is supposed to be the low voltage part. And the low voltage part, for all intents and purposes, can be thought of as ground, so that's why I just put the zero there. Also, in a circuit, you're allowed to put the ground anywhere you want. To be honest with you so i can just connect the ground to that and you're just it's sort of like the same thing as when we did potential energy and you could take uh the bottom of a gully on a railroad track i mean on a, a roller coaster you could call that the zero of height even though that might be 50 meters above the ground the same thing happens with the electric circuit uh since we're dealing with voltages that's a potential and you can add any constant to it and it's not going to affect anything because it turns out to get the electric field, you got to take a derivative. And if you take a derivative of something with a constant added to it, that constant plays no role in it. So that's why you can put the, the uh, actual ground anywhere you want. And most people just assume it's right next to the negative side of the battery. So uh, let's calculate the electric potential from uh, point B to point A. So there's our B, there's our A. So VB minus VA is equal to, as we uh, said before, that's the negative integral uh, from A to B of E dot VL. Okay. Now, what we know is the electric field in here is a constant. 
it's uniform because generally speaking, these plates are closer together than they are tall. So what we're going to get is negative integral of E, which I'm going to say points to the right. So that's E making my coordinate system like this. I'm going to say E is equal to some E zero I hat. And then the DL, I'm going to choose the direction uh, based on the range of integration. And I'm going to choose DL to point in the positive coordinate direction. So DL is actually DX I hat as well. And then I'm going to go from X equals, uh, let's say, zero. And let's say this width is just plain D. So I'm going to say from x equals zero Did I draw that backwards? Yes, I did draw that backwards. I drew my symbols backwards. Right here, I'm telling you I'm going from a to d, a to b, and I'm actually going to integrate this way. So this should have been my a and this should have been my b. Make sure y'all correct that on your notes, by the way, everybody. Okay. So I'm integrating from zero to, in fact, D. Uh, this is in the positive coordinate direction, so I'm doing my line integral properly. Uh, the good news is the, the electric field is a constant, so I'm immediately going to write negative E0 out in front, and then I'm going to write the integral of DX, and then I hat dot I hat, which is just one, so nothing happens with that, and I'm going to go from zero to D. And that will actually give me negative E0 times D is my electric fee, is my voltage. So this also tells us something neat. Uh, delta V, which equals VB minus VA, is actually equal to negative ED, which if you solve for the electric field, you can see E is equal to negative delta V over D. So now we have a new unit for the electric field that hopefully makes a little more sense than Newtons per Coulomb. So let me write this now that we have found this extra thing that's super helpful. I'm gonna say that the electric field has units of Newtons per Coulomb, but now we see it's also the same as a volt per meter. That will come in super handy for instance today on your lab where you're gonna do uh, electric field mapping, okay? So we now have this neat new expression. We know how the voltage is related to the electric field of a capacitor. And this is only true, of course, for a capacitor. You don't get voltage equals E times D, except in the case uh, for a capacitor. Uh, well, I can probably imagine you can make up some other way to get it E times the distance, but in general, capacitor is the way you do that. Uh, in general, we still have to go back and use Gauss's law or Coulomb's law to calculate an electric field. Okay. Now, what did that tell us? Well, what we found was that the electric field was a negative change in voltage to D. Well, of course, it's a negative change in voltage because I went from a high voltage spot to a low voltage spot. Okay, so final, which is this one, zero, minus initial, which is this one, 50, zero minus 50 is negative 50. So I see that negative of negative 50 would give me electric field pointing in the positive direction. That's what I expect, okay? The weird thing is uh, positive charges do exactly what you expect with voltage. They go from low voltage to high voltage. But because of that little equation right there, change of potential energy is Q times delta V, Negative charges do exactly the opposite. So when a negative charge, like an electron, tries to decrease its potential energy, it does so by increasing its voltage. Whereas a positive charge decreases its potential energy by decreasing its voltage. So that's, that's the, the thing you got to keep in mind when you're trying to do these uh, problems is everything's sort of jacked up and backwards in some sense. Now that we have that, we can also do things like find the electric field due to point charges, or excuse me, find the voltage due to a point charge, all sorts of stuff like that. So uh, let me show you some examples of that sort. Uh, I think I want to use my black mint. 
So let's take uh, let's take a conducting sphere and yeah, let's let's just take a conducting sphere and set it at the origin and calculate uh, the voltage of it. Okay. So I'm going to have a, at the origin right there, I'll have a sphere of radius R. It's supposed to be centered, even though I completely missed the center. So this is the radius R, and it has a charge Q. And what I want to calculate is the voltage at any point, at any point R, a distance of R away, that is. Okay. So really, it's not going to matter from the spherical symmetry. It doesn't matter really uh, what direction you go. All distances R is going to have the same effect. So what I would like to know is right here at this distance r, v is question mark, okay? So what we know is the change in voltage, which is v final minus v initial, is equal to the negative integral of e dot dl, okay? What we know is that the electric field for this thing is q, Actually, we did big Q. So Q over four pi epsilon naught R squared R hat. That's what the electric field is. It points radially outward. Of course, if Q is negative, then that would make this point radially inward. But that's basically it. Does that make sense to everyone? We're just using Coulomb's law for a, a spherical charge distribution. So we've got that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider this relative to somewhere where the voltage would be zero. In other words, I would like to make this initial voltage zero. Well, I would expect that to happen when I'm infinitely far away. So what I'm going to do is take and imagine I'm way out here at R approaching infinity, and I'm going to come in, and I could actually come from any path I wanted to and end up right there. That would be fine. Uh, but the easiest way is just choose a path right along that line. So what I'm going to say is DL, this time I'm going to actually use the DL to decide which direction I'm, I'm integrating in my line integral, just because I want to show you it's okay to do that. Uh, I'm going to integrate inward. That's the direction I'm going. I'm going from, uh, from infinity to R, which is R less infinity, obviously. So I'm going to say this length is negative DR and then that points in the negative r hat direction. So that's why the negative's out in front here. And then I'm just going to integrate from big number to small, or excuse me, from small number to big number. So delta v, which is really just v final, since v initial is zero, is equal to the negative integral from r, appro or r equals little r up to r approaching infinity. Okay is equal to negative q over four, the negative I already put there, four pi epsilon naught r squared r hat dotted with negative dr r hat like that. Okay, this negative with this negative is going to make it positive. So I'll get the integral from r to infinity. And y'all know how to handle that infinity. We'll deal with that in a second. This is q over four pi epsilon naught here. And I just get dr over r squared, the r hat dot r hat being one. So now I've got q over four pi epsilon naught. Now the integral of r to the negative two is r to the negative one divided by negative one. So I'm gonna say negative one over r, and I gotta evaluate that from r to infinity. So what that means is delta V is equal to negative Q over four pi epsilon naught. Now I've got to do this one first. So I'm going to take the limit as R approaches infinity of one over R. And then I'm going to subtract from that one over R. Well, the limit as R approaches infinity of one over R is in fact zero. So I now get back the positive sign that I was shooting for or hoping for four pi epsilon naught, just plain R. That is a scalar. 
That means you get to work with it like a regular signed number. You don't have to think about the directions or anything else. There's no such thing as a direction for the voltage, okay? Since that delta V is in fact the voltage of the final, we now found out what the voltage is just being in proximity to a charge. So if I'm a distance R away from a charge Q, then this is exactly what my voltage is. Uh, my dad, for instance, who retired from Dominion Energy, it used to be Vepco and then Virginia Power and Dominion Power. Now it's just Dominion Energy. Uh, but he retired from there and he had found when he was uh, putting up some service lines, basically some people had built houses way, 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 way closer to the, the really high tension power lines, the ones that are way up on those tall towers. Those are on the order of 100, uh, 100 thousand volts or even millions of volts and in fact my dad could hold up one end of the voltmeter the red end towards the wires and then the other end towards the ground not touching anything and it would literally read a voltage of 500 volts in these people's house so that's what you're measuring there that could be a really really big deal uh, that was dangerous of course and uh the the power company sort of said hey you're building way too close and they knew they were but they were trying to be greedy uh, so anyways, you ended up having to, I think they ultimately ended up tearing down a lot of those houses because you didn't literally have to have a ground rod like every 10 feet and, you know, connected to everything. Uh, if you build a, a, a child's metal swing set out there, a kid could literally get electrocuted from it. So kind of a dangerous scenario. But that, that's our first example of using the integral form of voltage for something other than just like a simple capacitor. Uh, that's neat though, because now we can actually say, well, what are we going to do if uh, we consider R less than big R? So when R is less than big R, uh, what we can do is uh, calculate the rest of the way, find out what the voltage is for, and I'll say this is, uh, let me add it with a different color pen so it stands out. And let me not write it backwards, that wouldn't help. Okay. That's R is greater than big R, I think. <laughs> Dang, I did write it right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's little R greater than big R, yes. Yeah, in other words, we're talking for outside of the object. Now, if, if we wanted to, to work this out, if this was a, for instance, a metal sphere, uh, a conducting sphere, then basically what happens is all the charge resides on the outside. So I'm gonna go ahead and say this is a conducting sphere. It didn't matter when we were talking about the electric field outside, that's why I didn't have to specify. But since it's a conducting sphere, uh, we know exactly how they behave. They behave such that their charges maximize their different distance away from each other, which means they all reside on the outside edge. They, in fact, make a surface charge, which, by the way, I mentioned in the end of last session. This was after everybody left. This is the part of the video that I told you is there that you know nobody saw. Uh, you'll see that there's, in fact, a law of electricity and magnetism that basically says the perpendicular component of the electric field outside minus the perpendicular component of the electric field inside is equal to a discontinuity given by sigma over epsilon naught. And you're gonna see that right now. In fact, I, I showed that for a flat plate uh, and it's told you that that's actually a general rule, but that's exactly the case, but it's only the case if there's a surface charge. Like for instance, if we had uh, this being an insulator and the charge was distributed throughout uniformly, then there'd be no discontinuity because there's no uh, just a surface charge to be dealt with. The other thing about this is the electric field parallel to the surface out minus the electric field parallel to the surface in is actually equal to zero. So there's no discontinuity for the parallel component and there is a discontinuity for the perpendicular component. And then when we study the magnetic field, it's exactly the opposite. The magnetic field has a discontinuity on its parallel component equal to a surface charge or excuse me a sur surface uh current density the uh, times mu zero and the perpendicular component has no discontinuity so we're going to see that now so what we're going to do is we're going to integrate uh we're going to say delta v 
is equal to the integral from a to b of negative e dot dl, like always. Okay, this time I'm going to take it all the way out from infinity, though. So we're going to say it's equal to the integral negative. And what we're going to do is integrate from infinity into r or into big R. So what I'm going to do is this time I'll use the range of integration to dictate my direction. So I'm going to go from r approaching infinity all the way to big R. And out there, I know that the electric field is, in fact, Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared R hat. And then I've got, since I've chosen my limits of integration to tell which direction I'm going, I have to use the positive coordinate direction for my uh, line element. So I'm going to say dr R hat for that. Now I got to go the rest of the way from R equal big R to R equals uh, to R equals little r, which is less than the big R. And in that case, the electric field inside is actually zero. So I'm going to say minus the integral from big R to little r of, in fact, an electric field, which in this case is zero. dr l hat r hat excuse me okay so by me showing you two different ways in the same problem you'll still ask, you'll see that i still get the same answer it's kind of nice the answer is going to become uh negative q over four pi epsilon naught integral r squared under dr and again, that goes from infinity to big R. And this one just becomes the integral of zero is just zero. So I have to leave that. Uh, this one just becomes negative Q times this. Now this becomes positive Q over four pi epsilon naught R to the negative one power. Now it was R to the negative two. When you integrate that, you get negative r to the negative one. That's why that became positive. Now I got to do my range of integration, which is from r to infinity. So I'll say q over four pi epsilon naught one over r minus the limit as r approaches infinity of one over r. Again, this is zero, but it's in the other side. So now I still get the positive q over four pi epsilon naught, but big R in the bottom. So if you do Gauss's law, you will be uh, for a conductor like this, you'll have to treat, treat the charge inside as if it's zero. And then you use Gauss's law and you'll calculate that the electric field is zero. That's what I used right there. You can see it in your examples in your book, or you've already seen it by doing your homework. The main thing is now I have a graph of the electric field as a function of R and a graph of the voltage as a function of R. Okay, and here's the big R here. What we get in this case is the electric field at big R is Q over four pi epsilon naught R squared. And it's zero here and it goes to that quantity there. And then it falls off like one over R squared here. But notice something. The surface area of a sphere is four pi R. So that radius is R, is four pi R squared, right? Everybody see that? The surface area of the sphere is four pi r squared. So if I've got a total charge Q distributed over this, then that implies sigma would equal Q over four pi r squared. And that means that Q over four pi epsilon naught 
r squared is actually just sigma over epsilon naught. So you see, in fact, the discontinuity is sigma over epsilon naught, just like I warned you and like I did at the end of the uh, video from Tuesday, which again will be up uh, hopefully before lab. So now that I have that electric field, again, we uh, you can work this on your own or you can see it in the book examples. Now I'm going to do the voltage. In the case of the voltage, it turns out that at R equal R, R equal big R, the voltage is Q over 4 pi epsilon naught big R. And in fact, for all R less than zero or less than big R, it's that same quantity. And then this falls off like this proportional to one over R. Excuse me, one over little r. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions on that? Okay, now the other easy thing is uh, we're, we actually have the ability now to make up charge distributions by just adding, you know, strings and strings of charges. So, for instance, uh, before I could have asked you to calculate, let's say, we put a charge here, we put a charge here, we put another charge up here, and then I could calculate, ask you to calculate the electric field right there. Let's say this is this is the y-axis. Let's say this is uh, 2.0 meters up. Uh, let's say this is uh, 1.7 meters over. And this is the x-axis. And this is at the point, uh, let's say, 0 0.75 meters, and this is at uh, point 0 0.8 five meters right here. We could have calculated that, you know, if we knew the, the charge here, and uh, that'd be Q1, the charge here, Q2, and the charge here, Q3. And in fact, what we'd have to do is calculate the electric field here due to this one, then make, you know, just using Coulomb's law to get the magnitude, and then we'd have to render it as a vector. Uh, it would obviously point along this line. And then I do it for this one, and it would obviously point along that line. And then I do it for this one, and obviously it point along that line. And then I had to add those vectors and get the total vector right there, and that would be the electric field strength there. But check this out. What if I say this is 0 0.111 times 10 to the negative 6 Coulombs, Let's say this is uh, 0 0.111 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. And let's say this is negative 0 0.111 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. In other words, 0 0.1 microcoulombs all around. Well, if I do that, now what I want to do is what is V at point P? That would be the question. Well, Y'all can see the work going into this to calculate the electric field. It would have been a nightmare. But the work or the energy uh, required to solve this problem is quite a bit lesser. So let's, let's do it. Let's say, first off, the voltage at P is equal to the voltage at P due to 1 plus the voltage at P due to 2 plus the voltage at P due to 3. So the voltage at P due to one is not too bad. I just have to figure out how far away it is. And it's going to be, in fact, 0 0.111 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs over 4 pi times 8.85 .8 times 10 to the negative 12th coulomb squared per newton meter squared 
we can reevaluate that now in terms of uh, uh, in terms of joules. Uh, for instance, we could, our volts. For instance, we could say a newton meter is a joule, and one of those coulombs with one of that with that joule is going to be a volt. So I could say a coulomb per voltmeter. So that's another unit we can use for epsilon. Now the other part is that I just have to have R. Well, this is lined up directly under it. It's supposed to be dead center. So you can sell, tell the difference is just 1.25. So times 1.25 meters. So one of these coulombs is going to cancel out with that. Then I've got a, a volt, uh, a, yeah, a volt meter down here, a volt per meter down here. So I can actually work this out. And let's get what the number is. 0.111 e to the negative six divided by parenthesis four times 3.14159 times 8.85 e to the negative 12th times 1.25 meters. And I get 798.47. Uh, and that should come out to be volts. Let's double check. So I said this should be coulombs per voltmeter. Is that 3.25 meters? Uh, 1.25 meters. It's two meters and then it's 0.75. So this distance is. 1.25 meters. Okay. Was that Colby that just asked that or was that Aaron or somebody else? It was uh it was Colby. Okay. Is that 798.47? Yes. Okay. And I've used way more sig figs than needed. I just put them all there. And notice the coulombs per volt meter down here. The meter on the bottom cancels out with that. The coulomb that's left up top cancels out with that. So I do, do just get uh, per volt in the bottom means a volt on top. So that works. Uh, now what I got to do is figure out the voltage at P due to, that was number, oh, that was actually number three. I don't know why I wrote one there. That was number three. I'm going to do at number one now. Now that one's a little more complicated because I got to figure out what this distance is. But it's really not that complicated. It's just a you know Pythagorean theorem thing. So I'm going to again say in this case negative 0 0.111 times 10 to the negative six coulombs, and I'm going to divide that by four times pi times 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12th coulombs per voltmeter, and then that's going to be uh, 0 0.85 meters squared plus 0 0.75 meters squared, square root of all that. And that should give me an answer. 0.111, I'm going to go ahead and put this negative over here because I'm 100% confident I'm going to forget it. Divided by parentheses. Ooh. I just found an easier way. I forgot my calculator lets me calculate whole lines from before. So I'm just going to take this and say enter. I'm going to do it really easy. So now in place of 1.25, I'm just going to drop down inside of there and put a square root thingy. See, I can just put that same formula. I'm going to go delete, delete, delete. I'm going to put a square root. I'm going to say 0.85 squared plus 1 point, no, 0.75 squared. So without the negative, that gave me 880.47. Volts. Okay, so I got that. Now let's do V at P due to two. I think you can tell 
This is 0.85, which is half of that. So it should be exactly the same as this one, only positive. So it's going to be uh, 0 0.111 times 10 to the negative 6. 4 times pi times that times the same square root. All that stuff's going to give you positive 880.47 volts. So you choose, these two are going to cancel each other out. That one's all that's going to be remain. So the voltage at P is just equal to 798 volts. I didn't have to do any vectors or anything. All I had to do is add and subtract. In other words, add positive and negative numbers. So why are we using the equation that we got from the, the sphere, the Q over 4 pi epsilon not R? So it turns out that uh, we discussed this a little bit in the book in chapter 20, uh, 21 and 22 for that matter. It turns out that a point particle, which is what these are, behave exactly like a sphere of any radius, as long as the charge is uniformly distributed over that sphere. So what we worked out was the voltage for a, uh, for a finite sphere of radius R and total charge Q and found it was Q over four pi epsilon naught times R in the bottom. So that really is the voltage of either a, a point charge or any spherically distributed charge distribution Q. Does that answer your question well enough? Yes, sir, that makes sense. Okay. And, and like I said, it's just a whole new, easier thing to deal with. And not only that, as I warned you, you can actually get the original information out. Like, you know, there is a way now that you have this V, there is a way to actually calculate what E is. So it turns out that once you have V, uh, you get something really nice. And in fact, there's a, a series of rules. Basically, it says, OK, if you have a conservative field, okay, then the curl of the field is zero. This is called the curl. This is a vector calculus thing. So what it means is just like a regular cross product, you're going to want to take a determinant of a matrix. You're going to put the I hat, the J hat, and the K hat as the top uh, row. The next row is going to be partial with respect to X, which just means a derivative with respect to X as if all the other variables are constant. This is a shorthand way of writing that rather than writing that whole fraction. You could just write partial X, partial Y, partial Z, and then this would be EX, EY, and EZ. If you actually calculate this and it equals zero, and I mean it equals zero all the time, it's not just a certain case of X, Y, Z gives you zero, it's gotta be identically zero, then this is a conservative field. Remember we were talking about conservation of energy? That's what that means. You don't have conservation of energy unless you're dealing with conservative fields. So the gravitational field, since we were able to make a potential energy out of it and uh, that sort of thing, that must have been a conservative field, and it is. Not only that, it turns out then that if you integrate you're just going to get some V of B minus V of A that is independent of the path. Okay. And it's not a coincidence that I'm using V there, by the way. Okay. That's not a coincidence. You'll see why in a second. So, if any one of these is true, then all the other ones are true. That's that's why I'm putting these arrows like this. Also, the closed integral of E dot DL is always going to be zero. Okay. That's sort of the same thing as this. If you say VB, if, if you're integrating from B to B, that's what a closed integral is. You've got to integrate over a closed loop where you start and, and finish at the same spot. Then you're going to get zero as a result. 
And this all apply, applies that there exists a scalar field V such that that's these are mathematical symbols that I like to teach my students in case you run into it in your uh, math class. And I write it like this so you can see this is just such that it's just like the beginning of the S with the T such that E is equal to the negative gradient of V. Okay, and this is it. This is how we can now take our voltage and calculate what E is. So what we mean by that is you take the negative partial of V with respect to X and put an I hat after it. Then you take the negative partial of V with respect to Y and put an, a J hat after it. And the negative partial of V with respect to Z and put a K hat after it. Then you actually have the actual electric field that you've avoided using all this time. That's what this is called a gradient. That's called a curl. And by the way, this is called the divergence. So you can get back to your you know, movies with Jennifer Lawrence and whatnot. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, there are these vector quantities. You take this gradient operator, which is basically an I hat partial with respect to X, J hat partial with respect to Y, plus K hat partial with respect to Z. If you cross product it, you get a curl. If you dot product it, you get a divergence. And if you just put it on a scalar, you get a, uh, dang it, I just lost it. Uh, you get a gradient. And it is actually when you're when you're watching the the weather, and they say there's a large pressure gradient. That's what they mean. They're taking the the difference in pressure from one point to another and dividing it by the distance between those two points. That's the pressure gradient, and that's what drives wind. Uh, there's actually more parts to this. Like this creates a uh, an exact differential equation. So those of you who had the differential equations where. Uh, the derivative of the thing in front of Vx, if you take the derivative of that with respect to y, you get the same thing as you do when you take the derivative with respect to x of the thing in front of dy. That is a uh, exact differential equation. And in fact, there's an exact differential equation that this is related to as well. But this is enough for the vector calculus portion. So it turns out if any one of these things are true, they're all true. And uh, that gives you sort of a deeper insight to where we're going. And in fact, all it takes within a scalar to compute any vector field is the curl and the divergence. The only difference between uh, two vector fields that have the same divergence and curls is one vector field might have an arbitrary plus three on it or a plus two uh, in each component. So, uh, that's where we're going with that. And now we know a way to actually calculate the electric field from a specific electric potential. So as an example, one of the examples I put on uh, YouTube, actually that's twice failed in the try to upload. So it'll go up this weekend. Uh, one of the examples we did on my YouTube channel was we found out that the electric field uh, over a ring of charge so if you take a ring of charge like this, okay, and you calculate the electric field some distance Z up here, okay, it turns out that that electric field is actually equal to Q over, well, actually, let me find it in the book. Uh, crap, got so much stuff over here. Yeah. It was actually done in chapter 21. And it turned out to be the electric field would be QZ over 4 pi 
epsilon naught times z squared plus r squared to the three halves. Okay. So that's what the actual electric field was. It pointed in the k hat direction. It's only at that point. It, we, we, it gets really ugly if you try to calculate it off that point, but that's the electric field that they found. Okay. Now, check this out. You could do that same problem with the electric potential and then find out what the actual uh, electric field is. And that's what I'm going to do now if I can ever find that page again. There it is. So, if you wish to make an equation like Coulomb's law that has an integral form, uh, then it turns out that V is actually going to be equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the integral of dq over r. That's, that's it. That's this whole special equation. So when I look at this guy right here, I can say uh, dq is equal to uh, r d theta times lambda, okay, where lambda is equal to dq over dl, which is just, of course, uh, total charge q over 2 pi r, right? And in fact, all of those are the same distance away. That distance is z squared plus r squared. So I'm going to say v is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught integral of uh, lambda times uh, r times d theta, all that divided by the distance, which is the square root of z squared plus r squared. And I'm going to integrate this from theta equals zero to two pi. Well, you can see all this junk is just constant. So I get lambda r over four pi epsilon naught square root z squared plus r squared times the integral d theta from zero to two pi, which just gives me two pi lambda r over four pi epsilon naught z squared plus r squared. That's like the easiest integral ever, right? So now I have the voltage at this point right here, but the electric field is supposed to be given by the negative gradient of V, right? Well, the only variable I see in here that's X, Y, or Z is Z. So uh, I could actually, by the way, two pi lambda times R is just Q. So that's just Q over that same old stuff. So I'm gonna take the negative derivative of this with respect to Z. And what I get is uh, Q, over four pi epsilon naught uh, times z squared plus r squared to the one half power down here. So this becomes negative q over four pi epsilon naught. Now the derivative of this thing to the negative one half power is of course negative one half. Now I gotta take the derivative of what's inside of there, uh, which is z squared plus r squared. So it's negative one half. And then I'm gonna take that thing, z squared plus r squared, and I have to subtract the, co uh, the exponent. I gotta subtract one from that. So that'll be a negative three halves. And now I gotta take the derivative of what's inside there with respect to the z. So respect to the z, that means the derivative of z squared plus r squared with respect to z is just two z. So now you see that in fact, I get negative, negative, that makes positive, two and uh, one half and two, that makes just plain one. So I get QZ over four pi epsilon naught uh, times Z squared plus R squared to the three halves power. And that of course will point in the K hat direction. All of this should have been having a k-hat next to it. And lo and behold, that's exactly what we found the other way. So you can look this up in uh, maybe 
three pages from the end of that's approximately chapter 21. You can see we actually integrate that and make it out, and you, or you can look on my YouTube video. But either way, uh, you get this for the electric field over that, and it takes a little bit of work. It's actually not that hard. This one's easy. You then take this, and you can find out what the electric field is due to an infinitely large plate. But the main thing is this is the electric field directly over the center. I just calculated using this simple voltage equation, which is a scalar, and I got Q over 4 pi epsilon naught Z squared plus R squared to the 1 half in the bottom. Uh, I got that for my voltage. But then when I took the negative derivative, derivative of it with respect to Z and multiplied it by K hat, then I actually got exactly the same electric field back. So that's sort of the coolness of the electric potential is getting out of vectors makes life a lot easier and you're not losing anything. Just like when we left Newton's laws of motion and went to conservation of energy, we didn't lose anything. We lost the vectorness, but at any point we could always calculate V final minus V initial divided by the time taken and then get an actual uh, vector for acceleration, multiply that by the mass and then get a vector for the force. So all of that was still regainable, just like all this is still regainable. So any questions on that? Because we are actually done. You're welcome to uh, you're welcome to split now. Uh, we have a lab. I think you all are in my lab. Uh, we have a lab at 1.30. So you got about an hour and 10 minutes before that happens. So you're free to go. Uh, I'll wait around for the last person to leave in case you have any questions. Um, I have a question. Yes. I got a notification from the TCC alerts saying that the school is closed at 2. So will we be still be having lab, even though they said all oh, crap. online? No, the way I said that in my syllabus, if it happens anytime during the class, then it's going to be canceled. So, yeah, I guess I don't have lab today. Let me double check and make sure I got the same message in case somebody spoofed you or something. They're really jumping the gun this, on this, this one. This would be pertinent information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of be relevant, wouldn't it? <laughs> I got three notifications for it. One text message and two emails. Good guy. <laughs> I'm looking at it. Uh, TCC alerts, there it is. Inclement weather. Due to inclement weather, Tidewater Community College will close at 2 p.m. today, Thursday, January 20th. All in-person online class and activities are canceled. So as my syllabus says, any class that has a period during which the class begins has been canceled. So we have no lab today. 